Over the last six weeks, we've had a series on Romans 8, which is all about life in the Spirit. It's all about the promise of what life living with God in the everyday fulfills. It's a picture of what can be. And we live in this place right now, which is in between. We see parts of our past and we see promises of our future. And so today we're going to talk about what it looks like to live with the promise of and in the power of the Spirit. And if you have been tracking with us, I've been gone for the last three or so weeks because I did all the work of having a second child. And um, we have had some amazing teachers fill in the gaps from a teaching team that we're building from Nick to JT. Pete Peterson taught back in uh, the the winter. And today, Britt Alice is going to teach. And this one's a little special to me because I got hired in staff at CBC like 12 years ago. And when I got hired as the part-time middle school pastor, Britt was in high school here. His, 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 his family's been in this church for longer than I've been alive. I'm pretty sure that's a true statement. And um, it's so good to see God use people and see people step into their gifting. It's so good to equip people. It's so good to live out our values that we all believe we have a part to play. So today, Britt just graduated from Dallas Theological Seminary a week or two ago, and he's going to get up here, and he's going to give a sermon that's going to be amazing, right? And I'm going to feel all sorts of mixed feelings about my job security. But um, <laughs> it's a day worth celebrating all the way around. When we come together as the family of God, when we celebrate the family of God, and we see the hope of the future as we welcome new people into the family of God with baptisms. So like we do every week when I'm here, we're going to start by praying. We're going to pray that God takes away a a spirit of criticalness that we just adopt from our culture because we know that God has you here for a purpose. Listening or in the room or watching online, God's going to speak to us today. We know that's true. And so we're going to pray that that the spirit just teaches us today. And I'm going to ask that you pray for Britt, uh, that God uses his preparation. So let's pray together. God, I'm thankful to be here. I'm thankful that you're good to us. I'm thankful that you're a God that weaves into your people the art of celebration. May today be a day that we celebrate well. And ask if you are willing just to take a few seconds and ask the Spirit to teach your spirit today and to remind your spirit of the goodness of God. I'd ask that you pray for Britt, that he does a great job teaching us about the Holy Spirit today and reminding us why it is worthy of celebrating. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Good morning. Happy Pentecost. I don't think anyone up here has actually wished the congregation a happy Pentecost before. Uh, Like Charlie said, my name is Britt Owsley. I've been attending this church since I was a baby when my parents started coming here. I don't think it was quite before he was born, but it was around the same time when he's not that much older than me. Uh, I was actually baptized 18 years ago in that baptismal. I've been a part of this church as long as I can remember but I can't remember a time we've ever celebrated Pentecost before. And I think that's partially because as a Bible church, we mainly focus on Christmas and Easter. And that makes sense. Those are the two really big ones. Jesus was born, Jesus died, and he rose again for our sins and brought us new life. But in other Christian traditions, think like Anglicans, Catholics, Lutherans, some of y'all may have come from those backgrounds, Pentecost is... Not as big a deal as Christmas and Easter, but it's, it's up there. People actually celebrate it. It's normal to talk about it, to talk about the work of the Spirit, uh, but we haven't really done that as much. So I hope to talk about that today. Why should we celebrate Pentecost? And how should we celebrate Pentecost? Put really simply, Pentecost celebrates the coming of the Spirit, something that is unique in the history of the people of God. And the way that we're going to celebrate is by getting to know him better. 
This is where I feel like I have to stop and tell you that I've actually created probably a dozen different versions of this sermon. I've been researching for a couple weeks, and I really am finding it difficult to explain all of the different stuff that's in the Bible about why Pentecost is so amazing. There's so many promises in the Old Testament. There's so many things that are actually happening in Acts chapter 2, and there are so many things that it does for us as the people of God. I feel like I could talk probably for 10 sermons about it, but I'm going to try to keep it to about 30 minutes, so we're just going to try to focus on one thread that I'm going to try to pull through the Old Testament into Acts 2 and then apply for how we're going to celebrate today. We're going to talk about first, actually, sorry. This is the first time doing it up here. I apologize. Okay, so <laughs> first thing we're going to do is I'd love if y'all would open to Acts chapter 2, but I'm going to get there. I'm not going to start there. Second thing I wanted to say is actually Charlie was going to say on your phone, after I preach, we're going to be worshiping together, but because the screens are not working, if you would pull up crossroadsbible.org slash lyrics, you can get the lyrics on there. But it takes a second to log into the Wi-Fi and all that stuff, so if that takes some time, please do that while I'm talking. I won't be offended. So, starting with why we should celebrate Pentecost. To talk about that, we have to go back to the very beginning of the Bible. The very first page says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And everybody knows that verse, but a lot of people don't pay attention to that second one. Now the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. The Spirit of God has been around forever. And that makes sense. Duh. He's God. But somehow, growing up, I always missed that. I always thought of the Holy Spirit as appearing in the New Testament and becoming a thing then, but he's been around since the beginning. Actually, the Jews always thought of the beginning of the world as having God the Father, or God, and the Spirit of God. And John, you know, when he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, that's John trying to make sure you remember that Jesus is there too. But sometimes today, we only think about John. We think about, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and we think about the Father and the Son. And John 1 doesn't really talk about the Spirit, so sometimes we forget about him. But here he is, right at the beginning of the Bible, first page. As Christians, we believe in the Trinity. We believe that there is one God who has always existed. He's the Father, He's the Son, and He's the Holy Spirit. And I can't really explain how that works, but because it's what Jesus taught, I believe it. And it's actually taught through the entire Bible. And because the Holy Spirit is God, because He is all-powerful, because He is personal, because He exists everywhere, we should pay attention to Him. So something that we're going to see as we go through, the line that I want to show is when the Holy Spirit shows up in specific places. Sometimes he just shows up and it's like he exists everywhere, but right here he's manifesting his presence. Remember, Genesis says, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the water. There's these times that he comes and he hovers and he rests over things. So let's trace that through. He's hovering like a bird. He's ready to start creating. God the Father, when he created the world... You can say maybe he created by his son and by his spirit. Or as the psalm says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. Word and breath, son and spirit. Spirit is actually just a Latin word that comes from the word for breath. The spirit of God is the breath of God. He is God breathing on creation and creating the universe. And the breath of God is God's presence in the universe. When God shows up, all through the Old Testament, that's the Holy Spirit making God present. So we know what happens after the hovering over the water. God creates people so that he could love them. He could have a relationship with them. They reject that relationship. They sin. And then that sin separates them from the presence of God. But why is that? Well, the Holy Spirit is holy. Holiness is dangerous to sin. If the Holy Spirit is like a fire... Sin is like gasoline, and he didn't want to burn up all these people who are just soaked to the brim with their sin. Sin is a problem, and they need to solve it. But the Holy Spirit had a plan with the Father and the Son. They planned to use the people of Israel to solve the problem. So there's so many stories that we could go to, but think about Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is the place that Moses led the Jews 
out of Egypt, out of slavery, and he took them to Mount Sinai, where the Holy Spirit was hovering again. This time he was a cloud. He was fire, he was lightning, he was wind, and it was scary, and it was awesome, and it was terrifying and wonderful. And Moses went up into the cloud, and he came back down with the Ten Commandments. But another important thing that happened at Sinai is that God told the people, told Moses and a number of different people there, to build a tent. This tent was where God's very presence with the people was going to stay. Even though there was sin, there was going to be an altar, there was going to be sacrifices, and then those sacrifices were in a way going to make it okay to be around God's presence, even though we're sinful. It's in, in, in a sense, was providing a way for God to show his forgiveness and extend his forgiveness so people could draw near. But it was only the priests. Only the high priests could go into the very middle of the tent. Everybody had to stay outside. But when they finished this tent, the Holy Spirit actually came down from the mountain, all the cloud and the fire and the lightning, and he came and he rested on the tent. And then if you pay attention to the story of Moses, we're actually going to talk about the wilderness years in a couple weeks. Uh, Moses, uh, Charlie's going to start that. But as Moses is leading the people through the, pro- through the desert to the promised land, the Holy Spirit is guiding them as this column of fire and smoke. A really obscure story that not a lot of people talk about is during this journey, Moses got pretty tired. He had the Holy Spirit hovering and resting on him, and the Spirit was empowering him to lead the people, but he couldn't solve all their problems. There were millions of them. And so he actually asked God that he could appoint 70 others. God took the Spirit that was on Moses, put them on the 70 leaders, and they started to be filled with the Spirit and able, and able to do some of the things that Moses was doing. But Joshua, y'all guys remember Joshua? He's Jericho, you know? Fought the Battle of Jericho. Uh, Joshua, he was actually didn't like two of these leaders. He thought two of these leaders didn't deserve the Spirit. So he complained to Moses, but Moses responded, no, I want all of God's people for the Spirit to rest on them. He wanted everybody to experience what he was experiencing. I think that he was expressing God's desire as well. God wants to dwell with us, but our sin gets in the way. So what else did he do? Throughout generations of Israel's history, the Spirit kept coming on select people because he was guiding those people, doing different things, building the kingdom of Israel, establishing, following the law and the temple, and we get the prophets, we get the priests, we get the kings... We get all the stories and the prophecies about this Messiah who's going to come. And then we know what happens, the story of Christmas. Jesus is born. The Holy Spirit actually comes and hovers on a very specific young girl named Mary. She gives birth to the Son of God. He, you know, ministers. He grows up, but he starts ministering. A lot of people don't remember at the beginning of his ministry, the Spirit came down and then hovered on Jesus. And that's how John the Baptist knew he was the Messiah. Messiah is just the Hebrew word, Mashak, to anoint, to be anointed with something poured on like oil. The Old Testament says the Messiah was the one anointed with the Spirit. The person on whom the Spirit was going to rest, that was the Messiah. That was Jesus. So he started ministering. He started doing miracles. And we all know how that ended. That he went to Jerusalem, he was executed, and then three days later he came back to life. Because he was executed, like those sacrifices at the tent, he provided a blood sacrifice that metaphorically washes us, you know, him dying in our place, we now can be forgiven of our sin. That's the gospel. Because Jesus died for us, we can be forgiven. But then he also came back to life. And the gospel isn't just that he forgave us, it's also that he made a way for the presence of God to come back to us. So how did he do that? When we look at Jesus, right after he came back from the grave, he actually hung out for about 40 days with the disciples. He was teaching them, he was talking to them, and then we get this verse from Acts chapter 1, verse 4. It says, while Jesus was with them, he declared, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait there for the promise of the Father, which you heard about from me. So Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit But what's this promise of the Father? Like I said, in the Old Testament, there's this idea that the presence of God is coming near through sacrifice. And Jesus died and is providing that. But what else do we know about the Spirit? Ezekiel, like Charlie read for us, says, I will sprinkle clean water on you. That is, I'm going to provide a way for your sins to be cleaned. 
I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove your heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. That is, through believing in Jesus, because of the sacrifice of what he did, we get to be made new. But what else? It says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Or another way you could say it is, I will put my spirit within you and I will cause you to live the way I want you to, the way Jesus lived. The spirit living in us is going to enable us to obey Jesus. We've had a wonderful series in Romans 8 talking about the life transformation that comes from walking with the Spirit. Romans chapter 8 is a beautiful chapter. Uh, I think one of our uh, other preachers talked about how it's like a jewel and that it's kind of hard to mess with some of the things, but at the same time, it's beautiful and it brings, when you turn it, it brings all kinds of light. I think that we should spend a lot more time in Romans 8 than just what we've given it, but uh, you guys should go study it yourselves. But what we see in that is that the Holy Spirit is coming in us because of what Jesus did. And we can have that relationship with the Holy Spirit. We can have a relationship of being made new, being made righteous, being made to look more like Jesus. But what else? Joel, actually, is another prophet. He said, talking about the Holy Spirit, not that the Holy Spirit was going to be in us. One thing I didn't say about Ezekiel is the Holy Spirit being in us is kind of like, remember, spirit is the word breath. God breathes, and then you breathe in God's presence. That's the idea in Ezekiel. In Joel, we have the same idea as Jesus, that the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out like anointing oil, like Jesus, who was anointed with the Spirit. We're going to be anointed by the Spirit. First John actually says this, the anointing that was on Jesus is on us if we believe in him. So the Spirit's going to be poured out. The Spirit is going to be put in. The Spirit is hovering over. He's resting on people. And Jesus says to wait for this promise in Jerusalem. So now we get to Acts 2. Starting in verse 1, it says, Now when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. So stopping there, what's Pentecost? It's one of the Jewish feasts. It's six or it's seven weeks after Easter. So just like right now, it's seven weeks after Easter. We're celebrating it today. It says they were all together in one place. Who's that? That's the disciples of Jesus. Those are his followers who stuck around. He was with them for 40 days, and he left. He ascended to heaven, and he said, wait. They waited for about 10 days, and then the day of Pentecost happened. So suddenly, a sound like a violent wind blowing from heaven filled the entire house where they were sitting. Wind, breath, hovering over the waters, now filling this house. And tongues spreading out like fire appeared to them and came to rest on each one of them. Like the fire that rested on the mountain, like the fire that rested on the tent, now the fire is resting on the disciples. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. One thing that I didn't read in Joel, I'm going to go back to now. It says, And it shall come to pass afterward, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and even on male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. This prophesying, this 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 speaking, a lot of times we think of prophecy as telling the future. It's not telling the future in the Bible. It is sometimes like these prophecies about what God's going to do. But other times in the Bible, prophecy just means saying what God told you to say. And so on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit is telling the disciples, to start saying stuff. But they're saying it in languages they've never learned before. As we move down, we see that the crowd is pretty confused by this. And if someone in here is pretty confused, you're not alone. When the Spirit does stuff, people get pretty confused. But at the same time, he brings clarity. He motivates Peter to stand up, and he gives a sermon. And he explains, this is exactly what Joel was talking about. The Spirit has come, the Spirit's poured out. It's because Jesus died and rose again, Now we've been made clean. We've been washed of that sin, and now the fire of his holiness can come and be in us. So he invites everybody to believe in Jesus. And I would say that's why we should celebrate Pentecost. Because Jesus came, he died, he rose again, and because of that, the Spirit could come. He made a way in our hearts for the Spirit to come, and we can breathe him in like oxygen. He can come down on us like oil. He can hover over us like he hovered over the waters of creation. 
But what does that really mean for us today? I said we should celebrate because he came, but how do we actually celebrate? I would say we need to celebrate the coming of the Spirit in three ways, but all of them can be described as drawing near. We celebrate Pentecost because the Spirit came near to us, and so we celebrate Pentecost by drawing near to the Spirit, having a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Now, it's weird to talk about having a relationship with the Holy Spirit because normally Christians are supposed to say, you have a personal relationship with Jesus. But why couldn't we also have a relationship with the Father? Okay, so why couldn't we also have a relationship with the Spirit? If God is one, and yet at the same time he's three persons, like I said, I don't understand that. I just know that's what Jesus taught. Jesus had a personal relationship with his Father. Jesus had a personal relationship with the Spirit. I feel like we should too. I feel like I've had a personal relationship with the Spirit for about 10 years. For most of growing up, I didn't hear much about him. I heard a lot about Jesus, not a ton about the Spirit. But I started looking in the Bible. I started finding out he's all over the place. And I started actually trying to do these things, drawing near to him. So how do we draw near to him? First, we should worship him. We actually already did that, and we're going to be doing that. That song that I requested, actually, for our reflection song, Build Your Kingdom Here. It says, Holy Spirit, come invade us now. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. All of those wonderful things. It's a request to the Holy Spirit, praising who he is, asking him to come and work in us the things that Jesus said his kingdom is supposed to do. We're also going to be singing you know, uh, two songs that we're pretty familiar with. Uh, you know, The one that says, I will wait for you, I will wait for you. Holy Spirit, come renew all of my strength. These requests of the Spirit, but they're praising him for everything that he can do. We're also going to sing King of Kings. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. We've been doing it a lot, but we don't always think about it. We don't always see it. The same as Genesis 1, when I didn't see that the Spirit was on the first page. We don't always even pay attention when he shows up up here. But the Holy Spirit deserves our worship, right? If he's God, he deserves to be worshiped. I had a friend in college accuse me of idolatry when I suggested that we should worship the Spirit. I was actually playing a song, and I was, uh, mentioned it, and he just got really, really offended. And I, I don't know. Some of y'all might be a little bit offended. But here's what I'm thinking. He said that worshiping the Spirit took away from glory from Jesus, and I would never want to do that. However, that's kind of weird because we don't talk about taking glory from Jesus when we worship the Father. So why would... I asked him this, and he was pretty stumped. Why would worshiping the Holy Spirit take glory away from Jesus if worshiping the Father doesn't? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus even said, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. This is a pretty normal rhythm in the Bible. But he wasn't used to it, so he was pretty upset. He was stumped, though, so he kind of muttered and walked away. It makes me think about, there's actually an ancient Christian creed. Creeds are really just things where you say, I believe this, and it's a statement of faith, summarizes points from the Bible. A couple summers ago, I actually talked to, taught a, a summer class here at Crossroads about Christian creeds. One of them is called the Nicene Creed. It was written in 381 AD. In it, it says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the Lord, that means he's God, the giver of life, so he's the creator who brings life to us. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who is breathed out by the Father, who, together with the Son and the Father, is worshipped and glorified. Christians have been saying that almost every Sunday in different parts of the world for 1,600 years. So it's kind of weird to say you would steal glory from Jesus when it's something that he's already decided to share. The way I see it, Jesus loves it when people worship God. He's pretty pro-God. Pretty controversial, I bet. But he's pretty pro-worshiping the Father, and I would say he's pretty pro-worshiping the Spirit. Second thing I want to say to draw near the Spirit is to talk to him. To draw near to him by praying to him. This one, again, can throw some people off. Because you pray to Jesus, you pray to the Father, and that's it. So there's a joke in a lot of seminaries, I don't know if y'all have heard, that people talk about churches that believe in the Holy 
the, the, the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Bible instead of the Holy Spirit. Because they don't talk about him. They want to they pray to him. And again, this week, I was actually talking to someone. I'm going to call her Betty. And Betty uh, did not think, she, she thought it was weird that I suggested that we should pray to the Holy Spirit. But she went into a legalistic thinking about it. She, she knew her heart. She knew, I'm going to get legalistic if you tell me, pray to the Holy Spirit. Because she's thinking, okay, so sometimes I'm supposed to pray to the Father, sometimes I'm supposed to pray to the Son, sometimes I'm supposed to pray to the Spirit. So every day I've got to check off my box, and she's like, I don't want that. But what do we do? And I would say, if we're having a relationship with Jesus, the same way that you have a relationship with other people, you're not expected to talk to them all the time, but you're supposed to talk to them some. If you're going to talk to Jesus, if you're going to talk to the Father, talk to the Spirit. Guess what? We've already done that this morning, too. Charlie led us in a prayer to the Holy Spirit, asking that I could preach today, asking that y'all would learn today. And even the wording of the, prayer, of the songs that we've done were prayers. Holy Spirit, come invade us. Holy Spirit, come and teach us. Holy Spirit, come renew us. As we draw near to him in prayer, I think that we get to know him better. I think that it's more likely when you pray to the Spirit that he's going to prompt you. Because if you think about it, we pray to Jesus all the time, and there's sometimes we feel that urge, okay, Jesus is guiding me, he wants me to do this thing. But if we pay attention to what Jesus actually said, he said, when the Spirit comes, the Helper, the Spirit of Truth, he will guide you into all truth, and he will bring to your remembrance what I've said. According to Jesus' words, the Holy Spirit is the one who's supposed to be talking to us. And I think that the more that we talk to the Holy Spirit, the more you might actually hear from him reminders of what the scripture says, promptings of what to do, promptings of the thing that Jesus wants you to do in that moment. The Holy Spirit, you know, the Father is the one who is always working. He's always bringing love and goodness to people. And Jesus saw that. He said, I see my Father working and I do the works that he does. And now he is in heaven and he sent the Spirit to be with us. And now if we're paying attention to the Spirit, we can do the things that the Father's doing. We can do the things that the Son is doing. And he's gonna prompt us to play along to get involved, to do the things that he loves to do. When you pray to the Spirit, you should try to listen and listen for how he's going to guide you. The third and last thing that I just want to ask y'all is to study the Holy Spirit. You should draw near to him by reading about him in the Bible. What I've been saying today is so summarized, I've skipped over hundreds of Bible verses that talk about the Holy Spirit. He is all over the place. It makes me think about how when I lived in Waco, I was leading a Bible study. And we were learning so much. And so many people in the group were learning so much that we had a phrase that we used that I always thought was pretty funny. Someone would learn something new. They'd see something in the Bible they'd never seen before. Often in a passage they'd read a hundred times. And then they'd say, you know, I'm pretty sure God added this yesterday. And we always talked about how God was adding verse, verses to the Bible. Obviously, he's not literally doing that. The Bible, you know, is finished. But the things that look like he's adding are there because we've never noticed them before. If you look through the Old Testament, you would be surprised how often the Spirit is the one who's showing up doing things. We talk about Samson, but we rarely talk about how Samson was empowered by the Holy Spirit each of the times he does something when he's super strong. You know, Isaiah, he's always speaking by the Spirit. The Spirit of God comes down on the prophets. He comes down on the kings. He's moving all over the place, doing things all over the place. And then if you pay attention to the spots where it's not just, like the Spirit may not be mentioned, but say the glory cloud, or, or like I said, you know, the smoke and the fire and the lightning. When that stuff starts showing up, you know the Spirit is around. So you should study the Scripture. I can't cover everything up here, but... I recommend that you try and look for him. He is all over the Old Testament, but he's all over, also all over the New Testament, all over the ministry of Jesus, constantly doing things. And the more you study about him, the more you'll get to know him. And I say all this because I want you to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. My relationship has been so meaningful. I had a personal relationship with Jesus starting actually when I was four years old. I was baptized when I was nine, but I first believed in him when I was four. My mom explained to me that Jesus loved me, that he was the creator of the universe, that he died in my place because my sins meant that I needed to die, but he took it for me. And so if I just asked him to forgive me, he would. 
I said yes, and I became friends with him. And there'd be times when he would lead me to do things. There'd be times that he would show me stuff in the Bible I'd never seen before. But then it was around the end of high school, going into college, when I started to develop more of this relationship with the Holy Spirit. And honestly, by having a relationship with the Spirit and with Jesus, it opened my eyes to the fact that I didn't have a relationship with God the Father and how much he loved me, how much he wanted me to thrive and to be nourished and to follow Jesus the way Jesus wanted. So Jesus always talks about how the Father is the one who is nourishing him. The Father is the one who is bringing him life. You know, in John chapter 4, he says, you don't know the food that I have, the food of doing the work that my Father is doing. And honestly, I feel like it's through relationship with Jesus and the Holy Spirit that I've developed this, of of really feeling like when I can love people, when I can serve people, being nourished by God the Father himself. Relationship with the Spirit is not just the Spirit. It's the Father, the Son, and the Spirit all together. There's one God. <laughs> it's confusing. That's okay. A seminary professor told me the Holy Spirit is, or not just the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, it's not a math problem to try to figure out. It's a reality to experience, to enter into. And it's persons that we get to be friends with. We get to be the son of, we get to be the brother of, we get to be the friend of. So I'm saying all of this because I want you to draw near to the Spirit. I'd be willing to bet that if we all start studying the Spirit, we all start praying to the Spirit, if we all start worshiping the Spirit with more focus, we'll get to know Father, Son, and Holy Spirit a lot better. If you feel like what I'm saying might be weird or off or anything, that's okay. Uh, there's, there's something that's the sermon questions at crossroadsbible.org. I would literally love to get questions from people and answer them. But be a Berean. You know, there's the people in the book of Acts, they were Bereans. They were the people that took everything that the apostles were teaching about Jesus and they were checking it with the Old Testament. So go check my work. I just want to encourage you to pay attention to what the Holy Spirit might be leading you to. So to close, I'm just going to read at the end of the book of uh, chapter 2 of Acts, starting in verse 36. Peter is finishing up his sermon. He says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know, beyond a doubt, that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were acutely distressed and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, What should we do, brothers? Peter said to them, Repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, and for all who are far away, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. With many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this perverse generation. So those who accepted his message were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 people were added. At Pentecost, 3,000 people were baptized because of their faith in Jesus. Today, we're going to celebrate four. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for what Jesus has done for us. And I thank you that the scriptures reveal that because of what Jesus has done, the good news is that we can have a relationship with you. The very presence of God can come and dwell within us like air in our lungs. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are with us, that you love us, that you guide us, and you shape us to look like King Jesus. I ask, as we celebrate these baptisms, as we worship you, we would get to know you better, that we would draw near to you, and we would appropriately celebrate Pentecost. Amen.